All right, welcome everyone. My name is Stafor Mondam. I'm the coordinator for the IGRI, and welcome to the first research seminar of 2024. Uh, I'm going to introduce our presenters today before handing it off to them. So the presenters that we have for the January research seminar are Stanislaw Gzinski and Bartek Pielinski, both from the University of Warsaw. Uh, Stanislaw Gzinski is a PhD student at the University of Warsaw. His research interests lay in machine learning, focusing on natural language processing and biology applications. He's also the co-founder and head of technology at DeepFlare, an AI startup. Bartek Pielinski is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Warsaw. He's also a founding member of the Institutional Grammar Research Initiative. His research focuses on quantitative analysis of policy design, and an important part of his work involves applying computational methods to analyze language found in policy texts. And their presentation today is titled Application of Large Language Models to Legal Text IG Coding. Stanislaw Bartek, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Stanislaw Gizinski, as I said. And today I want to talk about uh, application of large language models to co IG coding. Um, so this is actually a project that's been going for, for a while. And before us, there was like a previous attempts at automating IG coding, uh, worth mentioning here to uh, two studies uh, by Vanoni et al. and uh, uh, Rice et al. And uh, those was uh, those was uh, applied to IG version one, uh, I believe. So our first goal here uh, in this project was to attempt automating uh, IG 2.0. And uh, we wanted to use large language models to this task. I will, uh, in the next slides, I will explain why, but this is like a thing that was also not tried before. And the third goal uh, that we uh, have in mind is to, to um, establish some cooperation between, between people and between IG researchers. And I will also explain uh, in depth what, what, what this means. So first, maybe <clears throat> let's first uh, talk about a bit uh, what are the lar large language models. So as I believe uh, most of the people here heard uh, about chat GPT or uh, GPT. So GPT is general pre-trained model and this is like a large language model and it works basically uh, as a as a tool by which we can um, which we can fine tune to different tasks and there are like two different kinds of uh, of a fine tuning of a model so the first is proper fine tuning which means that we provide the model with training data and we we update the weights of a model so the parameters inside the model using these training examples. And the other kind of uh, um, specializing model to a specific task is in-context learning, so-called in-context learning, which um, the difference here is that we do, do not update the parameters of the model, but we just provide the model some examples uh, by which it could infer what the task, what is like the nature of the task. So uh, those two those two approaches could be thought about um, by an analogy. So fine tuning is more like a conditioning, and the in context learning is more about like um, using the working memory of a model. So um, I will go in depth about what in context learning means in a, in a while. But uh, like first of all, why? why uh, we have chosen to use large language models to automating IG. This is because the large language models are um, very good at what is, what is called in-context learning, which I explained uh, in the last slide. And in-context learning is one approach to a, a kind of uh, training, kind of using of a model, which is called fine few shot learning. 
diffused learning basically means learning from a very limited pool of examples. So you don't have to have or the typical machine learning model. You have to have thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of examples. For, for a few shots, few shot learning, you have to have only a couple, couple of examples. So like a 10 or like 20 or something like this. So why this is very why this is useful? This is because the institutional grammar, as as I understand it, is very heterogeneous. So we have different levels of a formalism. So here we have IG 1.1, IG 1.2. There are different levels as it is natural because like each, each, each researcher wants to focus on the different details in its, in, in its study. So, so we have the first level of differences is like different differences between like formalisms and levels of analysis. And the other are domains. There are very different domains to, to which IG is applied. So, uh, and this means that training a general model for this could be very hard because it's like each use case is different and model trained on and performing good on one use case could fail on another, an, another use case. For example, model trained on international relations could, could not perform good on like um federal law or something like this so by using this in context learning which as i said i said is like a form of few shot learning uh we are able to have a way to fine tune our model to our specific case by using small amount of examples so this was this is what we wanted to study in like is this possible and to what extent this is possible? So maybe now a bit in depth how uh, in-context learning or works. So in a typical normal, going back to this slide, in a typical uh, fine tuning, uh, fine tuning procedure, you update the weights of a model. And in in-context learning, each time one you want to perform inference, uh, you provide some context to the model. So for example, here, we want a model which is like pre-trained pre -trained on a large pool of texts. We want it to perform this very specific task of translating English to French. So we prompt the model with such text where we provide a few examples. Here we have three examples of a solved tasks task this specific task that we want to solve so here this task is translating from english to french and the the last one is with without an answer so we expect the model to um, provide an answer here yeah so and each time we want to we, we want to infer we must provide some kind of examples yeah okay so so this is basically prompting with context, which is, which we use in this study. So, like, what 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 were what were, we, were we testing? So we were testing the ability of large language models to learn IG code on a legal text, and in this specific context of a few shot learning. So by using in context learning, we we are forced to use this few shot few shot setting, and this is what we wanted to test. Yeah. So we want to test how, how, may, how much sentences one need to, to, to be coded manually to have a model tuned for its specific context. Yeah? So <clears throat> our approach is, uh, is bigger than the, the, the part that I, I will cover in this presentation, because there are like the first step is a logical decomposition of a big sentence to a atomic statements. So this I covered in a, in a presentation half half year ago, and I when we finished writing down the results from this uh, will also be written down. So and after we decompose the uh, complex set statement to to its logical relations and the atomic statements, we we must parse those uh, atomic statements and assign IG tags to it. So we must code it. Yes, and this is what I will cover today. So what's the procedure? So 
here we focused on uh, two domains. So first was uh, the documents from the UNESCO and specifically the convention on safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage. And the second document uh, was the Paris Agreement. So this is a climate climate policy. This is not policy, but this is like an agreement, international relations agreement regarding climate, uh, climate action. Yeah. So what was the procedure here? The procedure here is that we had like, the UNESCO documents coded. We, each time we get the, uh, the raw sentences from the Paris Agreement, we split it using this logical decomposition framework, which I will not cover today in details, but those resulting in those atomic statements and those atomic statements, we inferred the uh, IG coding, prompting the model with examples from the UNESCO. So what we are testing here is the ability of a model to perform good on the statements from the different domain yes because like a cultural heritage and climate uh, climate change is quite different domain and then we we coded those uh, those sentences and we again selected some subset of those coded coded sentences and we prompted model again uh, with the coded sentences from paris agreement so from the same document yeah and we measured the performance so here is maybe like a more, um, more uh, uh, clear uh, explanation about this. So we had two, two data sources and we had three performance evaluation settings. First was, which I call few shot in domain. By this, I mean that the, the model is given the examples from the same domain. In this setting, it was either the model that we, we prompted with examples from the Paris Agreement, was given the task to predict, predict the uh, results, predict the tagging of IG, IG tagging of a, on the statements from the Paris Agreement, yes? Zero shot across domains means that the model have not seen any examples from this document. It only saw examples from other domain, yes? And the few shot across domains, this means that model is generally given examples from one domain, and it was given a few additional examples from this domain we, on which we are testing, yeah? So here we have uh, metrics, uh, so the results. Uh, the precision is basically a metric which in this context tells us that how many of the labeled, uh, labeled, how many, how many times the how how what the fraction of the times that the model labeled correctly those uh, statements? So here we have precision uh, in three in those three settings. So in domain, across domains, zero shot across domains, and few shot across domains. And as we see, uh, this is in most of the times that this like. All of the times the zero shot across domains is lower than few shots in domain. So this means that in this specific case that we tested between those two domains, the uh, model is able to learn IG coding much better when it is given the statements from the same document. The one ex one exception from this is or else this is basically because our uh, our uh, data set was very limited in this tag. So in this uh, example, the model have not seen a lot of or else's and uh, or else examples of or, or else stack in statement, yeah. And here we have a few shot across domains. So in most cases, again, it is bigger than zero shot across domains, but similar to few shot in domain, with a notable examples of some of the um, of of some tax, yeah. However, this is as I will tell uh, in a in a in a bit uh, in the future. This is a quite limited benchmark as it is uh, not very big, and uh, we want to investigate this further. But like, uh, 
going further because we performed an additional experiments. What we wanted to measure here is how the performance of a model changes with the number of the training examples it is given. So here, I this is, I think, um, interesting because you, you here is, I think, the first, first time I show you how many training examples you need to use this, yeah? So here, it, it is in, in domain. So it is, for example, here, the model were given only five annotated statements from the, uh, wait, sorry, from the same document. And it performed on the exact match accuracy in a, a below 0.4, exact match, match accuracy is basically how many, how many, a fraction of a, uh, of a statement that was that was annot annotated by the model 100% correctly. So each tag was assigned correctly. So you give the model only five examples and you get 0.4 exact match accuracy. So, and when you give it 20 examples of ex statements, one and a half statements is correct, is um, annotated 100% correctly. Yes, so by any means, this is no perfect. You, it needs a lot of manual corrections, but I believe this is uh, still uh, better than coding everything uh, manually. And so here we see that accuracy rises with a number of training examples up to some point. And uh, so, so by coding only five more sentences from one document, you can improve the performance of model by like not so much so uh, not as little yes as one could expect by changing the num the fraction by of the, the, by changing the number of training examples by five yes here we have this the same thing but split it into different tags so here we see that this trend of rising uh is consistent across most of the tags by some of the tags, we have some. Um, we don't have. We don't see this result, but this is mostly due to noise because this is like uh, the those tags that are have are not following this trend are not very common in our examples pool. So, <clears throat> so I believe that this trend will be visible across all of the tags when we build bigger bigger data sets. Yes, um, here again, or else is not very, not very, um, the model is basically not, not, not guessing it yeah, correctly. This is on the, uh, tested on the convention set, yeah, on the uh, UNESCO convention set. And this is the same uh, tested on the Paris treatment, on the Paris treaty. So the, uh, so here we see the same trend across most of the tags, but some of the tags are following like as unexpected trends. Yeah. So the next thing is basically I wanted to measure if this difference, those differences between uh, in content, uh, in document, few shot between across documents zero shot and across documents few shot, are those results noise or are those results reliable? So those differences. So what I have done here, here we have the setting, uh, the test set is the Paris agreement uh, or the Paris <clears throat> uh, statements. And the training set are 10, 10 in each of the, in each uh, fold, it's 10, 10 statements either from the Paris Agreement, either from the UNESCO Convention, or uh, five from five randomly sampled from each, each of those, yeah? So in the blue, and this was, um, this was, I ran the, this uh, 15 times, each times, uh, each time uh, randomly sampling 10 different statements and like holding out others as a, as a test test set and yes so here is and in the blue we see results of a matrix from the uh, models 
15 models trained on Paris Agreement. In the blue, we see, so by this, I mean, this is in document, yeah? So this is in document few shot. In the red, we see trained on a convention, but tested on the Paris Agreement. So this is, are, those are zero shot between documents. And in the green, we see the combined combination of those. So tested on the Paris Agreement, but trained on a five examples from the UNESCO and five examples from Paris Agreement. And so, and what we see here, basically what we see here is uh, that in the most of the those tags, uh, the in the most of those 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 tags, the performance in in the zero shot example, so trained on convention tested on Paris, is lower than the in document. And another thing is that this combined this combined setting, so giving the doc model five examples from the one document, five examples from the other document and testing it. This is very like variable. So the range of those of model performance is very wide. Sometimes it it um, it scores higher than the higher than only prompted from one document. Sometimes it scores lower. Yes. So this is quite interesting. And I have some hypotheses why this is that, but but this this like points in the direction that this could help to improve model performance. So because normally in machine learning, when you provide the model examples from different diverse data sources, it tends to improve the generalization abilities of a model. Yes, but yes, here this this seems to look like this, but this needs further investigation. So to sum up, conclusions. So few shot training of a, or few shot in context learning of an IG tagger is promising approach. However, it requires more investigation into on what exactly those differences in metrics depends. The more diverse examples, so giving them document that the model examples from different domains seems to improve model performance in some conditions and even few annotated examples from the same domain as shown here improves the model performance quite a bit so those are the main conclusions and the further work to do is to measure impact of tax distribution in training examples on the performance of model so we have quite unbalanced data set in terms of tags, which like, which is expected as like, or else statement is not so common in set, in those documents that we that we use. And so, what I want to do is I want to measure how the performance of model on RL, for example, on RL stack depends on the number of the RL examples it was given. Yeah, something like this. Another thing that needs to be done is benchmarking on more domains because now we have only two domains a climate and cultural heritage and i believe this this whether those um, findings are generalizable to other domains this is this is quite interesting and the other thing that we want to do is cooperation so basically we have this model and we want to measure its performance on different domains but we we there are a lot of domains and we we thought that the best way to choose those domains is to ask community so if you have some documents or some like some statements that you needs to need that you want to to annotate and you want to send us them we we you can send us the raw statements we will run them from our model send you back the annotated statements. And the only thing uh, we ask for is to correct them and send them back or just point out the wrong annotated annotations. So we can measure this performance on more, more domains. And by the end of this, I believe we can build a um, common pool of the data that could be used to 
benchmark different approaches to automating IG coding. So thank you for your attention. And I think now it's time for, for questions. It is indeed. So thank you, Stanislav, for, for your presentation. And yeah, we'll open the floor now to questions. Let me see. I see Maha has her hand up. So go ahead and ask your question. Hi. Uh, is on the amazing work. Uh, uh, I, 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 kind, I was kind of uh, wondering about the uh, conclusions and uh, like the variability between data sets. And, uh, and so like how more do you like how is your uh, serving right now. So I think you are uh, changing in terms of how you uh, uh, produce the of the model and also and difference in how the results are work. Yeah. It, it's, sorry, I, I think I had some, I don't know if it's on my side, but uh, there was some problems with the audio. Uh, yeah, like, same. Oh, Maha, would you be able to type your question into the chat? Is, is that an option for you? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, am I audible? Hello? You, we hear you, but there's a lot of static. So your question didn't come through. Oh, I see. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it okay if I like, try once again and then I can just type it in? Uh, I'm sure. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. All uh, right, yeah. So like when there was this discussion about like how more data could help generalize the performance. So I was wondering if you observe any uh, changes in performance uh, based on the prompts or the order in which the different domain examples were being uh, sent to the model. If uh, the set of examples or the particular precedence of the examples made any difference to the output you were observing. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I I I I I heard everything. So, uh, yeah. So first is uh, I think the question, if I understand it correctly, was about have we investigated whether changing of the um, order of the pro uh, in the of the examples in the prompt helped or like uh, or how changes in the prompt helped. So. Uh, I have not tested the order of the um, sentences of the examples in the prompt. And uh, the reason for this is that in the general, in the literature, there is like a, um, a, and people tested it. And it seems like in other domains, not IG, but in the similar tasks, it didn't like impacted performance more than noise. but. Uh, there are some things that we, one can do, if, and we we plan to do that, uh, to in the prompting technique, let's say, to improve the performance. Uh, so one example could be that what we have done uh, with this logical logical um, decomposition. So one can what one can do is um, iteratively prompt the um, model with first with a very big sentence and ask it to split it down into smaller sentences and then prompt it again with those smaller sentences or logically decoupled sentences. And this helps uh, with the performance, uh, but I have not tested, as I said, I have not tested the order of the sentences. One thing related to this that I also tested, but I don't have like uh, presentable result, results, let's say, is Assume that we have some pool of training examples, for example, 50 training examples. And in one time we can show model, let's say 10 examples, like in some, like in this task, I could was able to show the model 25 examples, but let's say for simplicity that one can show and at once only 10 examples. So from this pool of 15 examples, of 50 examples, how to choose 10 examples for each of the prompts so for each of the statements that we want to code. And what the thing that helped in my experiments was that 
basically I chose the most similar statements from the example of proof. Yeah. So the choosing of the examples matters. The order of examples, as I said, I have not tested it, but the literature says that it does not matter. But maybe this is this is something worth worth investigating. Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, great talk. Really interesting. Um, I, I have a actually a clarification question. I think I missed something, so I apologize for that. But can you explain again? Um, you have the few shot in domain, zero shot across domains, and few shot across domains. Can you explain what 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 that means? Few shot. I, I don't have that in my head yet. Yeah. Thank you for this question. I was zero uh, shot. Thanks. Yes, I was. I was worried that this will be um, a bit uh, confusing. So uh, maybe first, there is like a, there is a few shot, zero shot. This let's say about those two two things. So actually, in the machine learning literature, this is not very like rigidly defined. So, but. In principle, few shot means that we are not providing men like a lot of training data to the model. So few shot means we have 10 examples, 20 examples, but not like 200 examples. Yes. Uh, zero shot means that in this specific context, we don't have any examples. For, so I said um, here um, zero shot across domains as a way to say I have in these settings, I have a model which have not seen any annotated examples from, for example, Paris Agreement. Yes. So, and but it have seen some other examples. Yes. But it have not seen. So it is zero shot in the sense that it does not have seen any examples from this specific domain, this specific context. So there is few shot, zero shot, and there is also few shot across domain which is the term I coined. This basically means that it have seen few shot, few, few examples from the other domain, but not as many as in this few shot. Yeah, so this is like, uh, yes. And the other thing is that in context learning is one of uh, techniques by which we can realize, like but we, by which we can solve the few shot task. So like a few shot is a task, you have 10 examples, solve this task. And in context learning is using large language models to solve few shots or zero shots, like, yeah. Thank you, that helped, thank you. Yes, I have, uh, I could actually, there is um, like, I think the best, because when we prepared this presentation, I, uh, the Bartek had the same question and I think the best resource I thought I found, there was, are not that many resources with which rigidly like defines that because this is not very rigidly defined, but I found some like um, from a few years ago, so I can send it like later, but yeah. June, go ahead. Okay, Hi. Uh, can I be heard? Yep. yep. Okay, okay, thank you for the real interesting talk. I was as I said, have you considered using larger examples, samples, and uh, use other machine learning methods such as random forest and uh, SVMC and things like that. I know that's it difficult to get uh, more samples, but it's uh, maybe compare the performance with this model and other models might be more convincing. A second question is that you use mainly the Paris Agreement and also UNESCO Agreement. Uh, as a concern is that those two agreements are both international agreements. That's the reason why there is so limited LLs. And yep. the majority of IG analysis focus on the national policy. So have you ever considered as you're using, for example, using the policy from the United States, UK, or other English speak countries uh, to analyze what's the performance for this kind of national policy? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh... This is uh, actually this is this is the what we want to do. Yes, we we want to like move this further away from this domain of international relations because this is actually I said these are those are different domains, but those different domains are actually in bigger meta domain, which is international relations. And the reason for this is that like we worked on this kind of data 
before. So that's that's why we proceed with this. But but we we want to measure it on the ideally on like a lot of different domains. But this is like a lot of work. So that's that's yeah. So ideally, this should be measured on the on the country level policy, on the constitution constitutions, on the like a lot of different agreements. Yeah. So uh, different uh, statements from different domains. So yeah. So um, I don't think I don't know if I answered like uh, uh, fully your question or you need some uh, you have some follow up question. Uh, yeah, the other question is that I know it's difficult to get larger samples, but if we can get larger samples and use other machine learning methods, such as the traditional random forest or other things, just to compare the performance, such as show the F1 score, I think it can be more convincing that for us to know the performance of the field shot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, our work focused on like analyzing the few shot, few shot uh, approach to this. So if we gather, I don't know, uh, could you clarify, you mean uh, more training examples or more test examples? Yeah, more samples and uh, so larger samples so we so we can use the F SVM or random forest yes, to yes, 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 uh, yes. Yes, split it into mm -hmm. the test and the training and then go to the yeah, performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right, yes. So, um, like... In like in this in this year, uh, we want to compare this to traditional examples, but this requires more data than 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 we actually have. And we like uh, um, <laughs> we are good about thinking, uh, finding out ways to automate things because we don't like we are not very good at coding things. I think like I'm not very good at coding in IG, so I don't want to speak about Bartosz. Like Bartek is probably. So I don't know if uh, that answer your question, but we, we we think about it. But this is like uh, this requires more data. Yes, I hope this will come with time. All right, Alessia sent me a question in the chat, so I will ask that first before I get to the other hand raisers. So here is her question: I understand you are proceeding top down from logical structure to components. Could it make any difference that you proceed bottom up? and pre-process text with syntactic parsers, then use your tags as super tags. Mm. Could you repeat the first uh, first part of the of the question? Because I was like, lost my focus. Sure. So um, the question is, I understand you're proceeding top down from logical structure to components. Yep. Could it make any difference that you proceed bottom up and pre-process text with syntactic parsers then use your tags as super tags. Yes, it is like my work, this works. So maybe like I will go back in time a bit for a context. So uh, I think this is like, this This could also be good approach. And like in a pre, like in the past, I have used uh, syntactic parsers without LLMs to, to build like a rule-based IG parser. And, um, the problem is again with generalization to bigger sentences. So as the research showed that like purely by right, pure, like without any tricks, large language models are not very good to compositional generalization. So, and there are some tricks that you can do to like fix this. And like my inspiration for doing this in this way was like some previous studies on the some benchmarks like I have seen some parallels basically between how IG like parsing big complex logical sentences and the task of uh, parsing um, sentences in natural language to SQL which is like query language like and there I have seen parallel in a way that in both of these cases you have big sentences with nested logical relations and that's why like I basically was inspired by their methodology. And, but I think, yes, I think, I must think about this approach with, with like using our tax as a super tax, because do you mean that uh, we like the, in this approach, the LLM would get parsed syntactic, uh, like data parsed by syntactic parser in a, like a, in a tree form, or there is like an other, 
um, thought in this this thing because I I uh, like I, I like anyways either way uh, I think this is this could be like approach which could be even better than this but uh, but but I have like bottom up or top down you have to choose one yeah and I have chosen this and I think this is worth investigating if I understand correctly that you mean that parsing passing the parsed uh, syntax trees to large language model yes this is yes so so this is I think I must think about it but thank you thank you for this this is this is this is um, this is something to think about all right uh Chris go ahead I believe Juan was first, and so he may have, um, the, um, he can go first. Okay, thank Juan, you. go ahead. Thank you, Professor. You were first, but thank you for uh, for this space. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I have a question. I hope um, you apologize me if it comes from uh, the ignorance of maybe the methods or, but I would like to know, what do you think about uh, how the accuracy is improved or diminished uh, if you use the mix of other domains. For example, if I'm interested in parsing uh, criminal law statements, and for example, in Colombia, would it be better if I if the model is trained only using uh, uh, training examples from that domain or from criminal statements from Colombia, or having a mix of statements, for example, using what you have done uh, with the inter this international relation or these international uh, norms and norms from other countries that are would be uh, helpful for improving the accuracy. What do you think about that? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, uh, not ignorant question. Like at first say that like this is a very thoughtful question because I thought about this and I'm I'm like in principle, in general, when you do machine learning, it helps to have more diverse data. Yes. But this is like in this in context learning, there is like it depends on the task. Yes. And in this specific task that we are trying to solve, which means like parsing IG, uh, these limited experiments that I performed showed that it should help, like as you, sh as I like, it should help to have to have statements from both uh, this domain and other domain. But the, the question like, this must be tested further with, uh, with, uh, with more data and more domains. So if you are interested and you have some, some statements to annotate, like let's, let's, uh, uh, let's talk and uh, maybe we can, we, can, we can try to answer this question together. Yeah, yeah. Because there is also a question about uh, Mm, proportions of the in domain and out of domain questions uh, statements yes so um so so there are a lot of questions here to be answered but uh, short answer is i believe it should help yeah and these limited experiments show that it could help yeah so yeah. thank you chris go ahead Thank you, Stanislav. Um, great work. Um, really exciting. Really exciting to see the progress. Um, just um, um, one or two questions. I'm not sure how many you'll be able to disambiguate. But um, did you trace the misqualifications um, um, as well? Yeah, you reported the, you know, the 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 um, um, the the the, the um, correct um, qualification of individual, you know, uh, components of institutional statements using those models. But did you actually trace what the misqualifications were? For instance, if you had something that wasn't qualified as a direct object, was it mistakenly, for instance, identified as an attribute as opposed to indirect object? Um, because I could imagine this could be a relatively tracing this uh, mm -hmm. misclassification would be an easy way of. Um, you know, attacking and refining the model uh, in order to, you know, be more accurate on that term. That is kind of point one. The other aspect is um, I have missed the earlier part of your presentation, admittedly, so the blame may be on me. But the question would be, um, to what extent do you distinguish the parsing of, of, of components that are complex by nature, meaning have subcomponents? We talked about the OILs with which I assume in your samples uh, is decomposed into into individual institutional statements. So to what extent would have something that should have been 
uh, identified, for instance, as an uh, uh, as an or else, mistakenly is attributed or identified as an attribute because it's contained within an or else. Um, but again, uh, that may be my ignorance because I hadn't uh, seen the first part of your presentation. But perhaps uh, would that help? You know, um, um, more accurately qualify the, the 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 performance of your model, but also to improve the model afterwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh... First question, I, I will repeat them to like structure. Oh, sorry. Let, let's say, uh, first question was regarding the uh, confusion between components. Exactly, yes. right? The tracing, like uh, simply tracing, the direct uh, object versus the indirect object, or did it go into attributes? Or yeah, I, know, only, it... I only investigated it manually with Vertex, uh, but uh, I want like to properly measure this, but this, uh, I think we, we, we should talk about it later because there are some different approaches to this. Yes, for example, you can have, uh, <laughs> uh, but going to the, like, going back to the question, uh, the most uh, mistakes that model made was due to that model overfitted to the position in the statement where some part things are. And it's this is, I believe, due to, um, this is, I believe, due to, um, homogeneity of the data that I provided it. Yes, so in the one document, sentences are written by the same, like maybe not by one person, but the same cluster of people and they use the similar language and the positions mm -hmm. of the, let's say positions of the attribute is in the, attribute is in the first, in this specific document, in the first position, yeah? So model overfitted to this and this like cost confusion, but I must like, investigate this further yeah this is uh, i'm writing down this uh, a, a lot of good ideas thank you for hearing for, thanks everyone for them but going back to chris question the second question was if i understand it correctly uh, whether like how many times like model confused complex statement decomposition with some tag like or like could you re rephrase it because so, i'm not sure if so sorry sorry i mean but basically um, again, uh, absent my knowledge about the input statements, but if they are complex in nature, meaning they have, for instance, if an OIL can have um, institutional statement components in its own, right? So it can have attributes, uh, you know, activities or aim and so on, and objects inside. Uh, to what extent is it actually correctly figuring out perhaps that it's, you know, working in the uh, OIL space, but mistakenly picking up only one of the components and then saying it's an attribute, but it's about right that it, you know, is operating the correct scope of the statement, meaning actually within an OIL, right? So because um, that mm -hmm. would be a nose that you would differentiate between, you know, let's say primitive components, the ONTEC, right? And complex ones, you know, such as an OIL or an activation condition. That was the question there. I mean, yeah, it, it interacts probably to some extent with Alessio's proposal to, you know, have different attempts at parsing. But again, I didn't see the earlier part of the presentation. So um, yeah. you may have well talked about it. Uh, I I think we have not enough, like, enough statements with uh, to, like, uh, we have only, like, small amount of statements with this nested uh, or else with the institutional statement in it. So so I believe like uh, I could not answer this question probably as, as most of the questions here, like, yeah, but yeah. But uh, yes, it, they, 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 maybe like to clarify the input to the model was like logically the couple of statements. It does not, does not mean atomic statement. It just mean that if you could like logically decouple statements to two Rs, this will be like separate statements. And also we removed the statements that look similar, yes, like just uh, from this. And, but this nested, yeah, nested uh, um, statements, there are not many of them in this benchmark. And um, so, so, so I'm not able to answer this question. Yes. Thank you very much, fair enough. Thank you, yeah. great work, keep it going. Uh, thank so you, well. thanks for the question, yeah. Diego, go ahead. Hi, thank you. A uh, very interesting talk. Um, as like as Juan, I'm also uh, relatively new to this whole uh, methodology. But I was just curious about, and actually going off of what Chris just said of the or else components. So if you were to apply your or train your model on uh, judicial data and and the, the the or else component of those of those statements, use the word shall 
and then you applied the model to to other another country where the word and the judicial uh, statements use the word must. I'm just curious, how would your results change, or or how would you go about? How, how would that affect your model is more or less what I'm trying to ask. And I'm sorry, I'm not able to uh, characterize my question uh, better than that. No, no problem. Thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, um, this is the reason that why we want to like do this in, do this in future. Yeah, because like we want this to be usable methodology and like tool. So when one have like a specific domain or country or like any like domain, by domain, I mean, topic of the document, uh, type of the text, whether it's like international relation or like local local level or regulation and the country. So this all like creates like different domain matrix, let's say. And uh, the reason like why we have done this in this few shots setting is because we want to everyone to be able to like when we finish this, to be able to easily adapt the model to specific conditions uh, of this domain of, of specific domains. Yeah. So I believe if model was trained on on the where like shell was masked every time, like like the model is not able to infer that this domain changes if it's not given at least a few examples uh, from this like domain, which indicates that something changes. Yeah. So well, that's that the question is that it will not be able to generalize if it uh, if it does not see this those 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 statements from this. Thank domain. you. Thank you. If the changes are too too big, yeah, because like if the changes are small, as I have so shown in this zero shot across domain. Uh, example, the model is able to generalize to other domain, but if the changes in the language or like syntax or everything becomes too big, they're like, you need some data from this. Yeah. All right, so I think we will wrap it there. Thank you, Stanislaw and Bartek for, for coming on today and presenting your work. Thanks to everybody for attending and for the questions, and we will see you all next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Terrific work.